Hi, so this is a very short conversation we're going to have, so we're going to kick it off right away. I'm Marissa Mazria Katz, and this is Molly Crabapple. And today we're going to be talking about how do you freeze an instant? How do you make record of a historical moment that matches its gravitas? With the ubiquity of images, how do you get an audience to slow down and actually look? Molly Crabapple is an award-winning artist and writer who has reported for the New York Times, Guardian, Rolling Stone, and many more. She's traveled between war zones and Guantanamo Bay, Abu Dhabi labor camps, and post Maria, Puerto Rico. Her drawings of portraits and dramatic scenes were often taken when no cameras and where no cameras were allowed. And her sensitively rendered images drawn from life depict individuals that are caught in political systems that control their fate and future. And each offers new readers, news readers insight into a subject that is contemplative and introspective in a way that is far different from the split second nature of a photograph. So I've worked with Molly for many years. We first started at a project where artists were reporting on the news and that project was called Creative Time Reports with a public art nonprofit in New York. And then later on, we've collaborated on writing together as well as in my new iteration as the leader of a small nonprofit called the Center for Artistic Inquiry and Reporting. I've supported in my job um, in the realm of artists and journalists working with publications like The Atlantic, The Guardian, Al Jazeera, and many more to ensure that more artists' voices and their work are seen in mainstream news publications. I came to know your work, Molly, during the Occupy movement, which became really a central theme in what we published in Creative Time Reports in the beginning, because this was in 2011. And your very first piece that you did with us was around the sentencing procedure for Chelsea Manning at Fort Meade. And it was the beginning of many projects that we ended up doing together. And one of the things that was really compelling to me and to, the, to, to all of us that worked on this project was that you brought readers into the courtroom to feel it all, the tragedy, the determination, and the protests that were swirling around the sentencing. I want to talk a little bit now about your own process around how, in many ways, I find that art explores abstract truths, and when it's paired with the kind of rigorous journalism that you do, readers are able to understand a story in a way that is closer to how they experience the world itself. And I want to bring us very quickly into the story that you did very recently in Ukraine. So let's go forward with that one. So tell us a little bit about this piece. This was in the shadow of invasion, and this ran in the New York Review of Books. So tell us, what are we looking at right now? This is an image of the golden-domed Mikhailovsky Monastery in the center of Kiev, and the plaza, which has become a graveyard for destroyed Russian military vehicles. In the summer of 2022, six months into the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, I traveled to Lviv, Kiev, and Odessa to document daily life as it was lived in the shadow of war and under Russian bombs. I sought not to show just the tragedy, but also to show the profound resilience of Ukrainians as they fought for beauty and joy in their lives despite all of the horrors around them. And the reason that I chose to draw this image, which is from life, is it was the perfect encapsulation of that. This beautiful fairy-like building that had been destroyed by the Soviets in the 1930s and rebuilt after Ukraine's independence contrasted with these machines of death in front of it that Ukrainian families were visiting to to curse. So one of the things that I think is really interesting about your practice is, see here, these are some other images from it, but the, one of the things that I wanted to talk about with your practice is your writing and how I often feel like there's such a visual nature 
that you bring into your writing, in so much as your art informs your writing and your writing informs your art. And in particular, there's this one line from this New York Review of Books piece about Ukraine that really stood out to me and sort of indicated how much this is part of your practice as an artist and a writer. So the, the line is, outside the window, the endless wheat field suddenly gave way to a blur of hallucinatory yellow. So I wanna talk a little bit about how you've seen your own art practice transform the way you write. Well, I've been drawing since I was four years old. I cannot imagine a world where I do not draw. If I was on a desert island, I would draw. I'm drawing here every day. Drawing is how I see and comprehend the world. I did not get my start as a journalist. I do not have a college degree. I got my start as a illustrator working in nightclubs. Now, these things might seem paradoxical, right? Because nightclubs are not serious and journalism is very serious. However, what nightclubs taught me was they taught me how to capture the essence of things fast how to see clearly, how to draw true, even in adverse conditions when waitresses were jostling me and spilling drinks at me. They taught me how to capture the fire eater or the burlesque dancer in the exact most important second that most summed up who they were. And these were all the skills that I brought to bear when I started drawing as a form of journalism. Now, I started doing journalistic work, uh, as you said, because of Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street, for those who don't know, was a 2011 movement against financial corruption in America that was brutally crushed by the police. It also happened uh, down the street from where I lived. And I started going to Occupy every day and I was frustrated with the bias and how the media portrayed it. The media wanted to portray it like they do so many protest movements as a bunch of pie in the sky freaks and malcontents who had nothing interesting to say but I saw something very different. I saw ordinary people who were profoundly indignant with the uh, corruption of the elites in society. And so I went down with my sketchbook to draw what I saw. And that is how I became a journalist. Everything that I did as a journalist came from that. So let's move on to this piece, which is perhaps one of the most well-known. So tell us a little bit about this. This is for Vice, and it's called It Don't Get Mo Better Than This, and it came after a visit to Guantanamo Bay. Tell us, how did you get there? How did you decide what to draw? And how, how did the news, did, sorry, did Vice deal with the drawings that you gave them? Were they excited by it? Did they question it? Talk a little bit about the editorial process after you came back from the trip. Guantanamo Bay is one of the most highly censored places in the world. It is a place where nearly 800 Muslim men um, were incarcerated and tortured, mostly without charge, most of whom would never be charged. It's the place where America's cheerful niceness comes smack dab against its inability to be good. I got access to Guantanamo Bay the same way everyone does, which is that I applied for one of their press tours. There are press tours to Guantanamo Bay. And during those press tours, one of the first things you have is you have this briefing for what they call OPSEC, which is a series of rules uh, that constrains journalists that are there. And the rules are specifically onerous against uh, photographers and videographers. At first they sound like, oh, you can't you know, photograph door, you can't photograph cameras, but before you know it, what the rules actually mean is that your camera is pointed directly at the floor, and anything that is not a picture of the floor or something like it, your military sensor will delete off your camera. However, as an artist, I am able to draw around that censorship and also to make that censorship explicit. These images, uh, first is a Camp X-ray, which was the hideous outdoor uh, series of cages that captives were first held in Guantanamo Bay. The second is a force feeding chair that the military proudly showed off. The captives were involved in a hunger strike when I was in Guantanamo to protest uh, their indefinite detention and the military showed off this chair to show their uh, humane 
way of uh, breaking these men's hunger strike. Uh, the military doctor has that sort of mask because I wasn't allowed to draw faces and I wanted to show that I wasn't allowed to draw faces. So when you came to your editors and you showed them this work, I mean, at this point, you had been working just a few years in this role as a kind of artist and journalist, right? So what were, what were the conversations like? Were there, did they ever come to you and say, we want more of something else? Or did they have responses to the choices of colors you made? Or tell me a little bit about like what that dynamic is like for you when you produce and show those pieces and then also your reporting. Oh, uh, my, I loved my editor at Vice. They were totally down with all of my choices because, Vi because Guantanamo is so visually censored. Uh, the fact that I was able to uh, make these crimes of the powerful explicit and visual was considered a, a huge asset. I filled two huge sketchbooks with sketches and then just chose the best ones, the ones that I thought, you know, summed up those moments the most. Okay. So, this is another important piece that you did for the New York Review of Books, again, and it's called Puerto Rico's DIY Disaster Relief. I'm just going to scroll through a couple of these images because, so those were some of the images from that piece. Now, your, um, you spent a lot of time in Puerto Rico. Your father is Puerto Rican, and you went there right after Hurricane Maria. Can you tell us a little bit about what you saw and how you went about, basically you had many stories that came out of this trip and you went back quite a few times. So talk a little bit about your work after Maria and the stories that you created and how you approached the, the subjects that you did and the images that you chose to, to use in the piece. Thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, my father is Puerto Rican. I would go during the summers when I was a little girl, but I hadn't been back since I was eight years old. Now, Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States. It is not a state, it is a colony with all of the inequality and resource extraction and neglect that that implies. When uh, Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico in 2017, 3,000 people died in the aftermath, and they did not die because they drowned in the storm. They died because of criminal neglect by the local Puerto Rican government and also uh, by the federal government, which was under Trump at the time. Trump came down and famously threw uh, paper towels at people's heads as a form of aid, and then insulted Puerto Ricans. These stories were deeply personal to me because I was writing about my own people. I was writing about my friend's barrio that was destroyed, uh, that did not get its electricity back for eight months. The first aid they saw after Maria, it was 10 days after, was a truck that came by and gave a small packet uh, that included a kid-sized thing of potato chips, one bottle of water, and a tin of uh, sausages. So that's the bad. But what I also saw was I saw the astounding solidarity and mutual aid of the Puerto Rican people. One of the first things that sprung up after the hurricane was a series of uh, communal kitchens, comidores sociales in Spanish, that were uh, created originally by activists from the Puerto Rican student movement, student radicals. And these did not merely feed people, though they did at a time when there was not food, uh, but they did it with an emphasis on beauty and dignity, with people playing music outside and games for the kids and artists doing a Puerto Rican art form, uh, the Cantastoria. And I was so inspired by people who were, to use Rebecca Solnit's term, creating a paradise out of hell. And I kept coming back. And two years later, what I saw was that these spaces of solidarity and self-organization led to the protests or took part in the protests and played a leading role in the protests that overthrew Puerto Rico's corrupt and venal governor that mocked the deaths of those 3,000 people. And I also uh, covered that. So let's move on to this. So the title of the talk is Artists on the Front Lines. And in fact, this story took place 
almost right outside your home, right? Right in front of your, in front of your door. It was downtown New York, your previous home. Um, tell us a little bit about how you found your way into this story, which was made for the nation, and how you basically did a whole recap of a movement in which taxi drivers were protesting the, the incredible amount of debt from owning medallions in New York City. I uh, knew about the taxi drivers' anti-debt protests because I'm a New Yorker, and they had been protesting for years against these debts that were unpayable and had led to multiple suicides by drivers. But I learned about the taxi drivers' protest camp, which is what these drawings are from, uh, through a Twitter account of an assemblyman who was involved. It was 2 a.m. when I saw the tweet, thank you algorithmic timeline, but I decided to go to the camp anyway, and I saw a few old guys sitting on plastic chairs in the barren waste of downtown Manhattan during COVID, who I just started talking to. And what I saw out of that protest camp, which later spurred a uh, hunger strike that these men took part in that was going to be a hunger strike to the death. What I saw was the most profound labor organizing that I had ever seen by the Taxi Workers Alliance. And I knew that I had to document it, that I had to get these stories of these working class people who are so frequently made invisible by our city. So I just started hanging with the guys and talking, even before I knew I was gonna do an article. And then I started drawing their portraits. I wanted to make New York's immigrant working class visible. And I started giving the portraits to the guys. I started making prints for them, giving it to them, and they started putting it on the windows of their taxis during protests. Uh, this, the guy on, what would that be? Would that be your left? That's uh, Mohammedou Tipu Sultan leading a chant of driver power. On the right is uh, another driver named Kubar holding the uh, number of his father who had died of a heart attack of stress from the unpayable debts. And when I was approaching this story and when I was talking about these guys, I didn't just want to make it some sad story where you feel sorry for people. I don't like that. I don't think that pity does anything. I don't, I don't think pity is productive. I wanted this to be a story of tough as nails, working class men and women who are fighting and who won. And that's what I tried to show in my photos. I mean, my drawings. So we don't have a lot more time. Let's, I would like to talk about this piece. This in particular was a commissioned by um, Doctors Without Borders where you visited the Domiz refugee camp in Iraqi Kurdistan. Tell us a little bit about this and what I think is really interesting and why I selected it was because you sort of see all of your reporting amidst the drawings. And I'm curious if this is one of the ways that you find yourself working, especially when you're out in the field. Oh, absolutely. I, I drew these pictures at uh, the height of that moment when many Syrian refugees were coming to Europe. And these are pictures of families that were about to make the journey who were in a refugee camp in Iraqi Kurdistan. And I drew these pictures just sitting and talking. That's the basis of what I do. It's I sit and I talk to people, you know, just to humans talking. And in between drawing lines, I would scribble down what they said. So this is like a combination reporter's notebook and sketchbook. And I think what this does is it shows the experience of being in this place of these intense emotions where people are about to risk their lives in this attempt to find something better, find a future for their kids. And I was trying to get all of those, those rich and tangled thoughts that they had before they made that journey. So this leads us into this next slide which for the audience, I'm curious if you can see what the highlighted prompt says. If you can't, it says, Syrian city destroyed by war, drawn by Molly Crabapple. Molly, what are we looking at? Uh, this is uh, an image from the AI art generator, Dolly, where Dolly scraped my copyrighted work, trained its AI on it, and now is allowing people to make uh, vampirized ripoffs of my work. That is what Dolly and all other AI art generators do. 
So I want to, that leads us into an op-ed that you wrote for the LA Times. We can all see what the title of that is. And one of the lines um, that you, you said in it, which I think is important, you said, AIs can spit out the work in the style of any artist they were trained on, eliminating the need for anyone to hire that artist again. People sometimes say AI art looks like an artist made it. That is because it vampirized the work of artists and could not function without it. Tell us what you meant by writing that and tell us what is your position on AI art and then how it is being used. Thank you. We're at this moment when billion dollar corporations funded by some of the most powerful and deeply unethical people in Silicon Valley have stolen millions of pieces of copyrighted work to create AI art generators whose purpose is to eliminate the need to pay illustrators and photographers. I've been very disturbed to see multiple panels at Perugia whose purpose is to hawk the products of these corporations. And I think that we need to talk about them. Every single major AI art generator, Dolly, Midjourney, Stability AI, is trained on millions of stolen images. It is a mass act of corporate art theft. So then do you think there's any ethical way that AI art can be used in any circumstance, in a publication, for instance? Uh, no, there is no ethical way to use AI art from major art generators. If you are an artist who trained an AI exclusively on your own work, that's totally different. There are some fine artists that do that. But anyone who, especially any publication, that is using AI art from major art generators like Dali, Midjourney, Stability AI, is uh, committing and enabling art theft and is also enabling the destruction of the illustration industry. It's deeply unethical. Okay, so then now that we have your take on it, what do you feel, given the nature of you know, the attendees um, at this festival, what are some of the things that people can do now about this? How do we change the culture around the potential use or the current use of this technology? Thank you so much for that question. First, I want to make something clear. While I'm speaking about AI art generators, because I am an artist and I'm someone whose work was stolen by them, the use of generative AI is not going to only destroy my industry. It is going to destroy all of yours if you're anyone who creates anything. If you're a writer, if you're an educator, a photographer, a videographer. The purpose of these corporations, who are, again, funded with billions of dollars, is to create products that disempower and de-skill workers and suction money from them to the corporate bosses. That is what they're for. So if you're anyone here who creates, it is in your interest to fight these uh, generative AI platforms. Now, I'm gonna talk about a few strategies. First, if you have a contest, if you do an anthology, explicitly ban the use of generative AI. If you're a member of a journalism union, or if you're a member of a unionized newsroom, demand that your company uh, make a pledge against the use of generative AI. And if you're a newsroom, make that pledge. Show that you stand up for human values, as opposed to this deeply unhuman, corrupt, and corporate future that's being shoved down our faces. Eventually, I hope that there will be laws that are constraining these corporations, and I applaud Italy for banning ChatGPT. However, right now, we have to rely on changing the culture. It should not be acceptable to be posting stuff from Midjourney, from Dolly, from Stability AI. This should be something that is shameful and that is stigmatized because it is theft. And the final thing that I want to say about it is there's a lot of people who are pushing AI, a lot of people who have a lot of money behind them, who say, oh, this is inevitable. Nothing humans do is inevitable. No corporation inevitably has to make people buy its products. No corporation inevitably has to have this much power. Technology is constrained by politics and by money, and politics, at least here and in America and in many other countries, is a democratic endeavor. We do not have to submit to this. We can fight it. Okay.
Great. I, I want to, we, we have very little um, time left, and so I just wanted to see if anybody had any questions. We probably have time for two or three. Okay. Sue, can you sue? I, I didn't say it again. We yeah. can hear you. You have legal options when it comes to Dolly, say, you know, as you described before. Can you sue? There's currently a class action lawsuit in America by artists and also um, by, um, is it Getty Images, I believe? And in Italy as well, um, an association of comics artists is currently lobbying the EU for a change in laws. And I predict many more um, class action lawsuits around the world. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm wondering, how do you work while on the ground? For example, at Guantanamo Bay, I don't know, do you have the time to like, sit down and draw or do you capture it or how, do, how does it work? Could you explain it a bit more? Uh, yes, so this is where my starting in nightclubs helped. I, I did not have time generally to sit down and draw, though a few places I did. Generally I was being uh, pulled along by a military minder and I had my sketchbook in hand and I was just moving my pen as fast as I conceivably could to try to get down that image. Hi, what do you think illustrations bring to the journalism industry that photography can't, and that's avoiding the fact that illustrations can go around censorship that's imposed on photography and videography. I want to start with my utmost respect for my photojournalist comrades who are like risking their lives and creating works of great art, so this is not a swipe at all to them. I think that we live in the most image-saturated time in human history, a time when I think there are more camera phones than people right now. And what an illustration is that a photography isn't is an illustration is rare. An illustration takes time. When you draw someone, you're sitting there and they can see exactly what you're doing. If they don't like it, they can move or they can tell you it sucks, right? There's uh, something I often think about, which is that we talk about making a drawing, but taking a photo. And that, I mean, to me, speaks to um, the more collaborative and horizontal nature of the type of drawing that I do. But I think that the most important thing that it does is that in a time of ubiquitous photographic images, what an illustration does is it says, like, stop, spend some time, because I spent some time. Okay, last question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, given the time constraint that you have, uh, I was wondering whether there are specific uh, aspects of uh, a scene or a person that you focus on uh, every time that you know that we, you will get the most of the, of the message from it. I think what you try to do is you, when you're drawing a person, right, you try to analyze them. You try to say, what is it that makes them different? What is it that sums them up? Like, what are they signaling? Is it like a sense of exhaustion with the world? Is it a sense of courage and strength? Is it a sense of defiance? And it's the same with the scene. I remember um, one time I was uh, in Gaza, and Gaza, of course, is under an Israeli blockade. And I saw the ruins of uh, a hospital that Israel had bombed, and there were men that were taking the rebar and they were straightening it with hand tools. And rebar, if you've ever seen rebar after a bomb, a bomb has hit, it's a very nasty looking thing. It looks kind of like black evil snakes made of metal. It looks like it's something that kills, which, which it does, right? Um, you know, when buildings collapse. And I wanted to show these people in defiance of everything, taking this evil looking thing and out of it, uh, you know, making life. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming.